Well, it's good to be in God's house. I hope you have uh, brought a copy of the Word of God with you. I, I'm going to be skimming over so many passages today. It might behoove you just maybe to write some of the references down. It may be easier for you in that process. Uh, you know, there's a four-letter word that uh, we probably don't need to avoid. Most four-letter words we do need to avoid, but... Uh, one four-letter word we don't need to avoid is the word that paralyzes most Christian testimonies. Anybody want to take a wild stab at what that four-letter word is? Fear. Fear keeps most of us um, from sharing our faith. I published yesterday in, a, in the Friday email, or actually day before yesterday, the Friday email, what I was going to be preaching. And I dare say some of the folks may have looked at that and said, you know what, uh, I don't want to face another guilt trip because every time the preacher preaches on that, I go through these emotional roller coaster rides because I am confronted with my fear when it comes to sharing my faith. But the fact of the matter is when we withhold our testimony and our faith, because of fear, what we've done is just handed the victory to the devil and said, here it is. And uh, one of the big things is that we really avoid the number one privilege that you and I have as believers. When I was in seminary, uh, as all seminarians that are preparing for ministry, there's always a set time frame that you are required to preach before the student body and before the faculty uh, so that they can critique and analyze your sermon. Most intimidating day of school that I have ever had in all my life. One of my favorite stories is about one of those seminary students who was just petrified. I mean, he was scared to death uh, to go in the pit and to preach, and yet it was required of him. So uh, days ahead of time, I mean, he just started getting all kinds of emotional upheavals in his life. So the day arrived finally that he was to preach before that body there and he stood up and the first words out of his mouth was, uh, how many of you know what I'm going to preach about today? And nobody raised their hand. He said, well, neither do I. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Seminary professor was so angry at him, said, now, young man, you need to understand if you're going to pass this course, you're going to have to preach. And you're not going to avoid this. I don't care how afraid you are, you've got to do it. So I'm going to put you on again for next week. So the next week comes and he's still just as scared as he could be. And uh, he, he, the, the, the student body, they, they'd made up, okay, if he pulls that trick again, we know what we're going to do. So sure enough, he stands up before those students and professors, and he said, how many of you know what I'm going to preach about today? And everybody raised their hand that time, and he said, well, since you all know there's no need for me to repeat it, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. <laughs> Professor said, huh, you're still not going to get by, I'm going to put you on for next week. Next week arrives, and the student body, they, they'd figured out, okay, here's what we're going to do now. He, he's going to pull it again, but we, here's what we'll do. So he gets up, first words out of his mouth. How many of you know what I'm going to preach? Half of them raised their hand. The other half did not. He said, well, since half of you know, then those that know tell those that don't. Let's pray and be dismissed. Well, that's the whole deal about evangelism, isn't it? It's about us that know telling those who don't. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, the Bible says, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. He didn't say, I hope you will become fishers of men. Maybe you will become fishers of men. He says, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. So if we're following Jesus, we are fishing. And if we're fishing, and if we're not fishing, we're not following Jesus. Now, you say, preacher, why in the world are you going to preach another message on evangelism? Because I've been listening to you preach for all of these years, and uh, it's woven into the fabric of about every message that you preach. Well, that is true. But the fact of the matter is, 
we still need it. It's a critical need within us as the body of Christ. Lazarus, he wasn't in hell five seconds. The very first thing that he thought about is that somebody please go tell my brothers they don't want to wind up here. We need it because it's an epidemic within the church. Do you know that out of the 44,000 Southern Baptist churches last year, one out of every four did not baptize one person. That means that even the pastor didn't win anybody to Jesus. There's a major problem. Now, let me give you, I have eight points today. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? I have eight points today. The elements that make up the privilege that you and I have as believers. First of all, it is of critical importance. Critical importance. Now, what is evangelism? You understand it is bringing people into a life-changing experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. You may want to you may want to memorize this passage if you haven't already. It's found in Ezekiel thirty-three eleven. God says. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I, I don't, I don't, God says, I don't, I don't want people to die in their sin. That says a whole lot about God's heart. But then he goes on to say, but I rather take pleasure in your repentance. And then he asks the question, why would you die? In other words, there is an alternative. There is an option. There are decisions that you can make to keep from dying and going to hell. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, woe unto me. You ever just done a little study on that word woe? Woe unto me. Judgment unto me. God's going to act toward me if I don't preach the gospel. When's the last time you asked, made that, maybe made that statement? Woe unto me if I don't share my faith. Woe unto me if I don't tell somebody uh, about Jesus. Powerful statement. It's an issue of truthfulness. Understand something. We have the truth about God. We have the truth about Jesus. We have the truth about others and ourself. Uh, and, and, and we know that without Christ, sinners are condemned unto death just as we were before we were transformed by the grace of God. It's an issue of transformation. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And there may be some of you that are here that, that are a lot like me. Huh? Listen, I'm flesh and blood just like everybody else, and I get intimidated in times of witnessing. I get scared in times of sharing my faith because I want to dot every I. I want to cross every T. I want to be articulate. I want to be able to answer all of the questions. I want to see everybody that I witness to come to faith in Christ. And that becomes a real problem to me. And sometimes it keeps me from sharing my faith. But here's the deal. Listen to this. Understand this. If you don't hear anything else, listen to this. You understand the power is not in the vessel. The power is in the gospel. I've, I've, I've trained a lot of people in evangelism. And, and, and in fact, the matter is, I've blown it so many times it's been unbelievable. And in training some of those folks, I, I, I'll get them out and it's their night to share. It's their night to talk. It's their night uh, to give the gospel. And, and, and I, I, I sit there and I'm thinking, dear me, what a mess. Th this is awful. And I just shake my head and I'm thinking, you sure didn't do your homework this week, did you? And then at the same time, I watch as those people that are hearing that mess pray to receive Christ and are gloriously saved. And I'm thinking, what's up with that? I'll tell you what's up with that. It's the gospel. It is the power of God. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 32 says, I have no pleasure in the death of them that dieth. Therefore, repent and live. Second Peter chapter three and verse nine, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Hear my heart a minute. Just know that God's heart is to see people saved. God's desire is to see people redeemed. Number two, 
It is a ministry of clear identification. Clear identification. This is very vital because the fact of the matter is we're not going to be very effective in our witness until we come to grips with who, knowing who we are and knowing who they are. Now, the reason so many are fearful in sharing their faith is because since they've been saved, they've never come to grips with who they are in Christ and who Christ is in us. There are six things in the Bible uh, that I want to give you this morning as it relates uh, to evangelism as to what the Bible says about you. First of all, he says you're the salt of the earth. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. So are you flavoring people uh, with the way that you live? Are you preserving society by the way that you live? You understand, you flavor the world with Jesus as a believer. Number two, you're the light of the world. Now what does light do? Light dispels uh, darkness. So you're to be a light on your job. You're to be a light in your neighborhood. You are to be a representative of the light. All right, number three, you have a fragrant aroma. Go home and read 2 Corinthians 2 and you'll discover that you, are, you have an odor. You smell. You say, I want to tell you the person I'm sitting next to right now sure does smell. But, but you have an odor before God. You are sweet smelling savour into the nostrils of God himself. And uh, in other words, people ought to be drawn to Jesus by the way that you live your life. Number four, you are ambassadors for Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, and uh, we'll come to that in a little bit and read that and kind of break it down for us. But, but, but it tells us that we're ambassadors for Jesus. Now, my curiosity got the best of me, and I looked into Webster's Dictionary just to get ready for today. Here's what Webster says is an ambassador. A diplomatic agent of the highest rank accredited to a foreign government or sovereign as the resident representative of his or her own government or sovereign or appointed for a special and often temporary diplomatic assignment. In other words, it's a person from one country who has been assigned to another country as a representative of the country from which he came. One of the things that you have to understand is that we, we're not citizens of this old world. We're citizens of glory and we're representatives now of the kingdom of God to which we belong. So we're ambassadors. Number five, we're witnesses. Acts chapter one, verse number eight, the Bible says you will be witnesses unto me. That's the last words Jesus spoke before he ascended back uh, into heaven. It, the, the fact is not whether we're witnesses or not. The real question is, are we a good witness or are we a bad witness? But we are witnesses. Number six, we are epistles. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, the Bible says that we are walking books that people are reading. We are letters that people are reading every day of our life. So we, we've got to constantly and consistently seek a platform that is going to bring about a credible witness to this old world because people are watching us. You've heard this many times before. It goes like this. You're writing a gospel, a chapter each day by the things that you do, by the words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what's the gospel according to you? Now, it's real important for us to know who we are, but it's also important for us to know who they are. Now, I could give you a litany of uh, scripture passages that would describe what lost people are and their characteristics, uh, that they are blind, that they are deceived, they are depraved, just like we were before we came to faith in Christ. And we know that they are seeking out something. They are looking for something. Something They have no idea what they're looking for. They're just searching for it. They look for a job or a career change. They're looking for something in relationships. It may be in toys or possessions, if you will. 
And it's real difficult. Would you agree with me that it's real difficult for us to watch them as they go from one garbage can to another garbage can trying to find something to get satisfied with. And we know that we have the answer. We know we have the, the solution to their problem. And we know that they're never going to find it where they are looking. And so we've got to tell them, I know where you are looking, what you're looking for. I know the solution. Let me tell you how you can find it. And by the way, we all know that because we all have them in our families, don't we? Now, let me give you number three. You ready? Evangelism is a ministry of crucial intercession. Intercession. So what, what those people that you see going from garbage can to garbage can, that are seeking and looking job after job, relationship after relationship. We all have them in our, in our sphere of influence. Uh, I want to challenge you to take a pen and a paper, and I want you to write their names down. Every one of us have at least 8 to 15 people in our sphere of influence that we know that need Jesus. So, so I want you to write their names down. Maybe take the 8 to 15 card. Maybe write them in the little fly leaf of your Bible. But somewhere where you'll be reminded to do this next step, and that is that you go pray for them. You seek God on their behalf. After you've made that list, start praying. And then pray for yourself. Pray that God would give you an opportunity sometime along the way that you could share with that person. In Romans chapter 10, Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for your salvation. You understand, that ought to be our heart. That ought to be our passion. An old English preacher by the name of C.T. Studd made this statement. He said, some want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. You know, it'd be easy just to hang out at church. I'd find that pretty easy if I just hung around church people all of the time. But the real challenge is to get out and mix it up with unbelievers. So you begin to pray and you let your heart bleed and pray for their salvation. Pray that God would remove the veil. The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded their minds that they cannot see. Ask God to, to destroy and to break down that veil that Satan has erected before their eyes that they cannot see. And then pray for your own spiritual impact. Colossians 4, 3 says that you're to pray for an open door that you could get into them. Verse 4 says that you are to pray that uh, you will have exactly the right words to be able to say when that opportunity comes. And then in Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says pray that the Holy Spirit of God would give you utterance and boldness when the opportunity comes for you to witness for Christ. Then let me give you this fourth one. It's the ministry of close interaction. All right? We've made our list. We've been actively praying for those that are on our list. And now then, we've got to come face to face with them. Uh, those people, some of them we work with. Others we socialize with. Others uh, may be in our family. Gene gets, listen to this. Gene Getz in one of his books, and I don't really remember which one of the books it was, but in one of his books on evangelism, he made this statement. He said, I've done the research and I've studied the word of God and I have found that Jesus spent in his earthly ministry nearly 50% of his time with people that were not of faith. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? He spent his time with people who didn't necessarily want him around until they discovered that they needed him around. If we're not careful as saved people, as people of faith, we're going to have the tendency just to gather into our little holy huddles on Sunday morning and with other saints. Don't misunderstand me. We need Christian fellowship. We need the body of Christ. We need to be spending time in small groups. We need to be sharing uh, with other people of like-mindedness. But we can't lose touch with the unsaved. 
How in the world, folks, are we ever going to influence the lost if we isolate ourselves from them? Here's what I do know. That once you give your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you go back into that old world which uh, you just came out of and you start telling them, let me just tell you what Jesus did for me. Let me tell you how he changed my life. Let me tell you how he transformed me. Let me tell you how he made me new. Let me tell you how he forgave my sin. Let me tell you the joy that he placed into my heart and my life. You won't have to isolate yourself from them. They'll disassociate from you pretty quick. But here's the neat thing about it. Before they did, you planted the seed of the gospel in their heart. You told them about Jesus and what he has done for you. Now, let me give you number five. It's a ministry of careful inspection. You know, it's one thing to be a witness, but it's another thing altogether to be a credible, effective witness. Some people are out there witnessing, you wish they'd just keep their mouth shut. I read just recently the story. Y'all remember the uh, rainbow-haired guy who carried the placard of John 3.16 with him? You know, he, he was at the Super Bowl. Uh, he'd show up at the World Series. Uh, it, it, people paid him uh, his expenses to go to every major sporting event just to hold up that sign. Y'all remember him back in the 70s and 80s? You know what he's doing now? He's serving three consecutive life sentences. He barricaded himself in a hotel, got him a gun, held some people hostage. You understand, there's just some people you wish they'd just be quiet. Somebody said that the best argument for Christians is, uh, for Christianity is Christians. Uh, people of God who's filled with joy and they have contentment. And then the best argument against Christianity are Christians. They're somber, they're joyless, they're complacent, they're self-righteous and narrow and repressive. Then Christianity dies a thousand deaths. I, I love what Romans chapter two, verse 24 says. Paul writing to the church at Rome, he says, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You know what scares me to death? is that the name of God would be blasphemed to other people because of something in my life. We, we, we've got to do a careful inspection of our life and maybe like Titus 2.10 to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. There's a book called Gentle Persuasion written by Joe Aldridge. Here's what he said. If you're not up to par, if you don't work hard, if you're lazy or sloppy, then cool it on the evangelizing. Back up your lip with your life or keep it zipped. <laughs> Pretty good statement. Number six, evangelism is a ministry of co competent inclination. Competent inclination. Now, a lot of people feel like <laughs> I gotta be like Jay Smith over here. Jay Smith is a gospel piranha. He's gonna to witness to a telephone pole if he thinks he'd get that pole into heaven. I can't be like Jay Smith. No, you can't. But you can be you, and that's okay. There are all kinds, if you study the scriptures, then you, you, you come across all kinds of different personalities and God used them all in their own unique giftedness. I think about Simon Peter. He, he was just bold and in your face and he was confrontational. He stood before thousands and he pointed his finger at him and he says, you bunch of vipers, you're the ones that nailed Jesus to the cross. And if you don't get saved, you're gonna die and go to hell. 3,000 of them got saved. But you think about the apostle Paul. Paul would be considered not such a confrontational preacher. He would be more of the intellectual kind. When the Bible says that he reasoned with them. You, you may be like the woman at the well. When she went back into the city, she was an inviter. She says, hey, y'all come. I want you to meet Jesus. He told me everything about me. Come meet Jesus. Come and meet him. You may be like the Gadarean demoniac. God delivered him, set him free. 
He wanted to follow Jesus. I just want to go with you, man. You know what Jesus told him? He said, no, no, I don't want you to go with me. I want you to go home and I want you to tell your family. You understand there are all kinds of different, uniquely gifted people that are out there. Just be yourself. You don't have to be somebody else. Just be you. Make your list. Pray. Seek God for the opportunity. And just in your own unique way of sharing, share with him. You understand it's a ministry of competence. Number seven, it's a ministry of correct information. You want to be sure that you've got your facts straight. There's no doubt about that. You, you want to be factual when it comes to describing God. When the Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to faith and in repentance. You need to be factual when it comes to Jesus, who was God in the flesh, born of a virgin, lived sinless, died on a cross, and rose from the dead so that you and I could be redeemed. You, you gotta be factual uh, about who we are as well and the way that we respond to that. You've gotta turn away from sin. You gotta place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and live for him. So you gotta be factual. And then finally, it's a ministry of compelling invitation. Compelling invitation. And you know what one of the tragic movements that's going on in churches across America now is that preachers no longer are giving a gospel invitation from the pulpit that invites people to walk down the aisle and profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm of this opinion in my humble but accurate opinion. I believe the gospel demands an invitation. How in the world could you give somebody the good news and then refuse to give them an opportunity to respond to the good news? The gospel demands that invitation, that verbal witness. I want you now, I told you I was gonna get you into 2 Corinthians. Look at chapter five and verse 20. Now notice what he says. Chapter five, verse 20. Now then we are ambassadors. We, we, we're strangers in this land. We are pilgrims. I don't belong here. I'm just passing through here for a little while. We are ambassadors for Christ. I love this next phrase. As though God did beseech you by us. In other words, it was through our life, it was through our testimony that God manifested himself through us so that you could be saved. We pray you in Christ's stead. We beg you, we plead with you, we adjure you, be reconciled to God. I love Luke 14 when he's describing that wedding, you know, and he says, go out into the highways and the hedges and notice the word, and compel them to come in. That, that's what we're to be in the business of doing. Now, now hear me, hear me, everybody look this way just a bit. Right here, right here, look right here. You're not responsible for the results. The Holy Spirit determines the success. You're just responsible to be the witness. The power is in the gospel. You're not responsible for the results. God's gloriously transformed us. He's brought us from the darkness to the light. He delivered us from hell and brought us to heaven. He came, we came from emptiness and he filled us up with his joy and peace and contentment. And now then he says to all of us, go tell somebody what he's done for you. So here's my challenge to us this second Sunday in September. Some of you have taken very seriously the eight to 15 cards and that's wonderful and I'm so glad you are in doing that. But for the rest of you, I, I want you to go home and I want you to make that list. I, I've got family on my list. I've got neighbors on my list. I've got friends that I've known for years on my list. Sit down before God. You know at least eight to 15 people and make your list. Write their names down. And today I want you to commit to praying for them. Seek God on their behalf. 
asking God, God, remove those blinders from their eyes so that they could see their need for Jesus. God, give me an opportunity somewhere along the way to be able to share my testimony and to share my faith and to share what you've done for me. And then God, when that opportunity comes, God, would you please empower me with the words that I am supposed to say at that moment? Who would have thought at three o'clock in the morning back in the late winter days when God woke me up about an ultrasound machine and a golf tournament that today three young men would be here as a result of that triplets and give their heart and their life to Jesus. I'm just telling you, God honors obedience. Be obedient to pray. Be obedient to witness. There may be some of you in here, you, you can't testify, you can't share your faith because you can't go back to a time and a place when God ever saved your soul. You can't go back to a place where he changed you. You don't have a testimony to share because the fact of the matter is you don't have the assurance that when you die, you're gonna go to heaven. But today ought to be your day. Today could be Today, when you receive Jesus Christ, this could be the place for the rest of your life that you could carry yourself back to there on that second Sunday in September at First Baptist Church in Indian Trail is the day that I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. That's the place, that's the day when my life was changed forever. You could have that today. Would you bow with me and let's pray together? Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.